So I met some of you um, before dinner, and I spoke to some of you um, during um, uh, dinner. Uh, and it reminded me of uh, the time when I started at the World Bank, so I'll start with a uh, personal story. Um, but partly relates to travel, partly relates to doing business, so that's why um, uh, I'm telling you this story. So I grew up in Bulgaria, this was communist times. Um, and then just when communism fell uh, in the late uh, 80s, I had already decided to leave Bulgaria, so I had uh, designed many plans um, to become a diplomat and leave, to become a top sportsman and leave. Um, so I was diverse, what economists would say, I was diversifying. I was at the time on the national track team, I was also studying um, uh, for diplomat and so on, and then communists suddenly fell, so actually I didn't have to do all of these um, uh, things. Um, and then I went to study uh, first to Vienna. I wanted to study international trade, international uh, business. Want to study, uh, want, uh, went to study at the University of Vienna, went to study then to Berlin, and then from there decided that at the time at least, this was some time ago, Europe was not too uh, open for uh, brave e economic thinking, so I went to the US and finished uh, there. And this was the time when Eastern Europe was opening up, the early, uh, the early 90s, so very quickly I ended up at the World Bank. I was not quite ready as an economist, but uh, coming from my region I knew a number of languages, Russian, German and so on. And when I ended up at the World Bank, they said, that's great news, so you know Russian, you know German, nobody in your region knows English, so we're sending you to do a number of projects. And I said, well, okay, fine, I don't really know anything yet. I said, don't worry, you'll learn. So first project, I was sent to uh, Moldova. I don't know whether you know Moldova is just above Romania, a relatively small, <coughs> small country. And I was tasked with two projects. I was at the time roughly UH, 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 mid-20s or so. And I was given two projects. One, to improve the business environment in Moldova, which at the time was all socialist. And two, more interestingly, to uh, restructure the wine and cognac industry. So that was my project. <laughs> At the time, because I was, as I mentioned to you uh, previously, a sports person, I didn't drink at all. And I told the World Bank, well, I have a problem. I actually don't know much about wine and cognac. They said, don't worry, you know, go, you'll learn quickly. Um, so I spent about a year and a half uh, traveling between Washington DC and uh, Moldova in this semi-sober state because you'd have to test, taste a lot of wines and cognac and basically give advice to the then state-owned uh, enterprises. This was all still um, uh, before uh, privatization. Frankly, I don't remember how I did because I never quite could get sober since you go in the morning to talk to these people and they say, okay, let's have cheers and you cheer once, twice, three <laughs> times and then, and then it, goes, um, um, it goes well. But apparently the project was considered a big success at the World Bank because my next assignment was the cognac industry in Georgia. <laughs> so then I spent about a year drinking heavily uh, cognac in uh, Georgia, which was significantly better than the Moldovan. Uh, one, I don't remember much of that period either, uh, but that was probably also judged a success because my third assignment was the wine industry in the Kyrgyz Republic. I don't know, I mean, this is like very far out there. And at that time I said, no, I need to basically restructure my own business line uh, and get out of cognac and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and wine. But I did have an interesting experience in these um, uh, uh, countries. And by now I do know some wines. Uh, although I still don't drink Moldovan, uh, Moldovan wine much. So roughly in this period of um, you know, growing up uh, in uh, various post um, post-communist countries, uh, along with the wine and cognac industries, I was constantly asked, well, how does the West do it? So how is uh, business um, done in the West and what do governments do to help it? Uh, because remember, a lot of these countries in Eastern Europe for 50 years, in the former Soviet Union for nearly 70 years at the time, or 75, they actually had a central plan. So nobody could do private, uh, uh, private initiative except for some very small um, attempts in agriculture. So you could have your own small agricultural land and perhaps produce some um, vegetables. But beyond that, not much, uh, not much else. So it was a real question by politicians, by um, parliamentarians, by um, 
people in the government of what is it the market, how do you create a market economy, and what's the best way for governments to regulate. That seems a relatively obvious question. I mean, if I ask you, probably you'd have strong views on how governments um, should uh, regulate. But at the time, which is not so far in the past, 2020 some years, economists actually didn't have a very good answer. At least they didn't have a very consistent answer. So there were lots of theories. So there are theories to the left. So if you studied in Paris, for example, at the time, I know some of you, um, some of you did, um, then they would say, well, government should regulate heavily because the private sector doesn't know much. We in the government know a lot. So basically, we'll tell the private sector how to do business. And in particular, we'll regulate to make sure that, roughly speaking, bad people don't run businesses. Because if bad people run businesses, lots of um, strange things can happen. In the US, there were several traditions. But uh, the prevailing at the time tradition uh, was the opposite of saying, governments are corrupt, deeply inept, uh, and very lazy. So don't really leave regulation in the hands of governments, because they will screw it up. Um, so do as much private initiative as you can. And if you have some inefficiencies, if the market does not somehow address some of the problems over time, it would resolve itself. So it would be apparent that there is an inefficiency. And only then uh, you, uh, you regulate. But a lot of the discussions was theoretical. So one theorist would say markets are bad, government good. And another one would say you know, governments are just very corrupt and inept, so don't really um, trust them. So in the late 1990s, which seems like a long time ago now, um, myself and a couple of uh, other researchers at the time, still mostly at Harvard University, thought that rather than just leaving these theorists to tell us how markets are and not, why don't we actually just study it? Why don't, don't we just go in a number of countries and factually find out how governments regulate? So this is how the Doing Business project that I'll talk to you about uh, today uh, came um, out. So I'll show you a few things about Israel so that you perhaps can find your own um, bearings or some benchmarks of how this is. And then I'll show you some of the research uh, globally, of which actually Bob already showed you one, uh, which basically says that if a country on the ease of doing business, which is a very simple index that ranks countries, I'll show you in a moment from number one in the world to number 190 in the world. There are 194 countries in the United Nations. So we basically capture everybody other than very, very tiny countries like Andorra, which do not have their own regulations. So they depend on other countries. So we have the world. And in the world, every year, what the Doing Business Project does is to basically say, if you're starting a business or running a business, how difficult it is. I'll show you um, uh, in a moment. What Bob told, uh, showed you here is one example that basically suggests that the easier it is to do, um, uh, to do business, I think this is inverse, so easier is in that direction, the richer you get. Uh, so in some sense, leave it to business to figure it out. The government shouldn't uh, overregulate. And I'll show you in a moment a few figures. But the point of the entry is that you also needed a lot of cognac and wine to come to this, uh, to come to this point. So it's called Doing Business. It's a project that started at the World Bank uh, with a lot of academic, uh, with a lot of academic uh, help um, over time. So this is what the project is. Some of you are in business. Some of you are helping businesses. Some of you hopefully will be in business. Um, and some of you are studying businesses. So the questions are actually remarkably simple. What we want to know, it's called the life cycle of, uh, of businesses. If I want to establish my own business, and I have, by the way, uh, established businesses in a few countries. How do I go about it? How do I start it? How do I hire workers? How do I deal with the various permits if I want to build an office or a, a warehouse? How do I get electricity to my warehouse or office so that you know air conditioning works? How do I register property? How do I uh, get credit so that I can develop? Uh, how do I uh, export or import? How do I pay taxes? If somebody is not paying me on time or refuses to pay, how they enforce contracts in the courts? And then if I'm not successful, how they exit? How they um, go through insolvency uh, proceedings? How do we come up with these indicators? Well, this is basically what businesses go through. 
And now there are some specialty businesses that deal with uh, some other regulations, for example, environmental regulations, which are not covered here. But for the average uh, business that has just started operation or is considering starting operations, these are basically the, the steps that it goes through. So what do we do? Well, we say we want to know how governments think of businesses or regulating businesses. How do you know what governments think? Well, I've been in a government, I can tell you, most governments don't really think. Uh, but if they did, um, uh, their thinking is expressed mostly in laws and regulations. So, you know, government decides on a regulation, it passes it through parliament, parliament writes it up, um, and then it comes out and becomes, uh, and becomes law. And we know where these laws are because they're available uh, in the various countries. The World Bank has offices in about 160 countries. Uh, so even before the internet, we were able to go from country to country and collect all of these um, uh, laws and regulations. So if, for example, in starting a business, every country has a company law. And the company law says if you want to start a limited liability company, for example, so if it's you and two other people who are starting a company, then for this limited liability company you need to do a number of steps and here is what they are here is how much it uh, costs for each step and here is where you need to go to so this is described in every um, uh, in every country and this is what we use so the doing business team which still is operating mostly actually with um, young people like yourself just out of um, school um, the doing business team notes a lot of languages, travels a lot, insanely actually, about 80% of the time the team is on the road, and they go from a country to a country and basically collect regulations. Now with the uh, internet it's a lot easier, so you don't have to travel as much, and then put all of this, transcribe them, so we have lawyers, we have economists, we have consultants, um, accountants and so on, and basically for every country on our website, which is doingbusiness.com, if you're interested in how to start a business, let's say in Yemen, perhaps don't start now, but uh, in, um, in other countries, we can tell you exactly how to start it. So you literally go and it says, you know, step one, step two, step three, step four. So I'll show you in, uh, actually I'll show you an example from um, Israel. So if you want to start a business in Tel Aviv, this is actually data for Tel Aviv, the company law basically tells you that you need four steps. So you first need to obtain the registration documents, which are actually online, so you would think that you don't need to go somewhere. But it turns out that you need an attorney, a life attorney, to sign that these are the actual documents, so you still have to have a lawyer, an attorney, to do it. Then you need to go to the Ministry of Justice, you need to go to the Ministry of Finance, and actually you need to go to two different places in the Ministry of Finance, or rather at different times, uh, in order to do this. So for our purposes, we say that to start a business in Israel, it takes four procedures in the sense that you need to go to four different places and file four different sets of um, uh, documents. If you're perfectly efficient, meaning you don't get sick, you don't get lost, um, the government agencies don't get closed early um, or they're not on holidays, it will take you 12 days. So we've actually measured um, through um, establishing companies how long in an efficient scenario it would take you. And it costs some money. Actually, in Israel, not so much this particular uh, step. But by law, it costs you a particular amount. So we collect all of this and then say, here's an index of how easy it is to um, no, that is because of the fees or because of the days that you are not involved? fees. So these are just official fees. So this is the starting a business topic right there. I showed you how much it is. And then I go through the same exercise, hypothetical exercise. If I want to hire one worker, how they go about it? What do I need to report for that worker? If I want a construction permit for my office or warehouse, what are the laws and regulations? Uh, that uh, determine that and then I construct this profile if you like of every country that tells me how to go through these processes and when I construct this profile I can ask another simple question which is where is it difficult or easy to do this and I have the answer for you um, so this is comparing one of the latest uh, years actually the uh, last but one year of data and it's just comparing rich countries uh, OECD high income um, countries. So members of the OECD plus a few other rich countries that are not uh, in um, 
uh, in OECD, but are rich, uh, rich enough to be. And it asks the question of across all of these countries, so the first number is a global ranking. Notice that some numbers are missing. That means that like number nine, for example, is Georgia, the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, which is quite efficient to do business. Uh, in So some numbers are missing, but this gives you the ranking, if you like, the relative ranking of, uh, of rich countries on our index. So you can think of this of if I were a global citizen and I wanted to start a business, <coughs> an average business, not a high tech necessarily or security business, just an average business, where is it easier to do this? And the answer is not in Israel. So Israel is, uh, <laughs> Israel is one of the difficult countries to, um, uh, to start businesses. In particular, across 190 countries around the world, it's 54th. It's not terrible, so they are worse countries. Not many rich worse countries, actually. Uh, and the moment you are you're compared to Greece, you understand that there is a significant problem in, um, in, um, in the business of your country. But, you know, Israel does not, um, on this ranking, do as well as perhaps you may have expected, or maybe you don't, but certainly not as the government expects. Because the Israeli government has had for a long time, not just this government, uh, kind of this uh, marketing campaign that uh, Israel is a place for startup businesses. Israel is very business friendly. It's a very high tech uh, uh, environment, which it is actually. Uh, but it turns out that for the average business, which is not called Intel or Google or a few other high tech firms, it's actually fairly difficult. Um, to start uh, business. This is in fact reflected in the average um, growth rate of Israel relative to other countries of comparable wealth and much less of human capital because to grow, to grow fast you basically need two things. You need capital and you have smart people. Uh, and relatively speaking Israel has a lot of smart people and it has reasonable capital. Um, you would think that Israel would be among the fastest growing countries in the world, at least at least in this class of middle income countries. But it's not. Actually, it's below average in the income class that it is uh, OECD <coughs> high income. So then the question is, why is that the case? I'm not saying that it's all about regulation, but certainly regulation plays, uh, plays a role. So then if you want to ask the next question, so suppose that yes, we agree that uh, on average Israel is not doing great, but maybe it's in, in some areas it is doing well, in some areas it's not. So this is the picture that tells you across 190 countries uh, around the world, uh, one is great and 190 is terrible, where is Israel relatively better and relatively worse. So relatively worse, registering property. So if you want to register property, meaning that you want to buy an apartment or an office building or a warehouse um, and have it under your name or your company's name uh, rather, it's fairly complicated. So you are ranked 130th of 190 um, countries in, uh, in the world. Why? It takes a very long time. It's very costly. And most, not most, but often you actually are just not able to do it. But there is so much regulation and so many steps preventing you from doing it that many investors just give up. So if you look at some of the reports of international investors who say why they thought of Israel is a good place to do business and then gave up, never did it. Um, this comes up quite often that uh, uh, basically obtaining property in term yes? What does it mean by protecting minority investors? So that means that if I have a company and I own 80% and you own 20%, uh, your rights in general should be protected so that this 20% uh, means something. So, so this is corporate governance, if you like, or laws protecting the uh, small shareholders so that they're not expropriated or I don't always say, well, let's not distribute dividends to the 20%, let's just get all the money for the CEO who happens to be my cousin, let's say. So that's the way in which minority shareholder protection is, uh, is designed here. It's mostly for equity markets, but not just public equity markets, as well as for, if you like, if you're a private uh, equity investor, how much um, security uh, you have. And in this case, you've probably, this is why you're asking, actually, it's relatively safe to be a minority shareholder investor in, uh, in Israel. So it's one example of good regulation that, uh, 
I'm sorry? No. That protects investors, so this is very good. Registering property, yes. So the particular minority shareholder investors here does not make, so it's either if you're domestic or international. The, I mean, I understand that there are some industries where international investors are treated differently than domestic investors. This is in the company law, so the general rule is, is it okay to be a um, minority investor or is it not okay to be minority investor in Israel? And the answer is, it's fine to be a minority investor. Mm -hmm. Likely, the likelihood of you somehow being expropriated or not being able to uh, make your voice heard in the company decisions is small. Um, uh, the issue is, I mean, as you go from starting a business, the life cycle of a firm to get to worry about minority shareholder protection, you need to start your business and then go through some of the other processes <laughs> to have your operations. And some of these processes, like registering property, happen to be before the minority shareholder protection, so you need to worry about, um, about this. There is actually an interesting, well, a series of interesting studies in economics. I'm not sure that they're totally true, but I'll tell you what they say. Uh, on, um, uh, on the case of Starbucks. So you know Starbucks from travel, hopefully. So Israel is the only country, well, the only reasonable country in the world that Starbucks actually has tried to get into and has failed and basically has pulled, uh, pulled operations. If you ask Israeli why that's the case, the answer is unanimous. It's because our coffee is better than everybody else's, so there is no, there is no reason to, start, to have Starbucks. But as an economist, I immediately answer, well, that's not quite right, because you have, among others, many American tourists. Americans don't know good coffee, but they know Starbucks. So they for sure will go to Starbucks if they know it, but they don't have it, so they don't go. So it's not the case that Starbucks doesn't have business. In fact, even in this hotel, there are many, many American tourists who I'm sure their first point of call in the morning is the local Starbucks store, because that's what they do in Italy, for example, in Spain or in France. And arguably, Italy has at least as good uh, of a coffee culture as, uh, as Israel. But the fact is, Italy has Starbucks, Israel does not have Starbucks. So then there are a number of researchers, not me, other researchers, who have studied why Starbucks failed in uh, Israel. They're, sto they're not Israelis, so the coffee uh, example, uh, better coffee doesn't work. They basically say because what is Starbucks? So they bring coffee from you know exotic places, allegedly, all <laughs> ecologically sound and uh, so on. There's a very simple process for making coffee. You basically need a coffee machine. So the only thing that you really need, other than the Starbucks uh, brand, is prime location. So you need to be on this corner and on that corner. So you need real estate. And to have real estate, you need to register property, sometimes to lease, sometimes to, um, uh, to buy. But if the property registration market is bad, a company like Starbucks just cannot compete because it takes a very, very long time to find this particular property that they like. And that's why after trying for a few years, Starbucks um, basically decided not to try any anymore. This is some economist, bad economist saying that, not me again. You may uh, trust them or not, but the fact is that uh, in the names of Starbucks investors, that was one of the main reasons, actually the main reason for not uh, coming uh, successfully to Israel. It's not only just property registration, there are some others that uh, are not ranked very well, so paying taxes, uh, not just the tax rate, but also the administration around uh, paying taxes. And then the courts, there are some lawyers, I mean, yes? difficult to pay taxes or then people don't pay taxes? I mean. So that it's even if you wanted to pay taxes that you need to, <laughs> <laughs> which some people, well nobody wants to, but some people do it, or some companies, it's more complicated than in other cases in the sense that you know you have, for example, a different corporate income tax system than a VAT system. So in most countries, if you're paying taxes, like even in a country like Bulgaria, a company goes to the same website and basically says, I'm paying corporate income tax or uh, VAT or excise taxes for that matter. And you do it at once. You don't have to file once for VAT, once for corporate income tax. In, uh, in uh, Israel, which is consistent actually with the way I showed you that, uh, no, the other, the other way, 
that companies get uh, registered. See, you already from the beginning, you have two different registrations. One with the Ministry of Finance, but the Income Tax Department, and one with the Ministry of Finance, but Customs and VAT Department. So that automatically doubles your work. And since VAT is actually paid on a monthly, or rather the revenue, uh, the revenues are calculated on a monthly basis, so you actually have to do the fourth step 12 times a year. So not, not once a year, but 12 times a year you need to go and basically report what your VAT uh, uh, income is and so on. So that's what makes it more complicated. So I'll finish uh, with this, but there are some good areas like minority shareholder protection that we should all be proud uh, of. And then some not so good areas uh, which include property registration, paying taxes and the court, so enforcing contracts, I was starting to say that. So if you have a commercial dispute, for example, you've provided a service and your client doesn't want to pay. So what do you do? Well, you threaten them, you, you know, do mean things, but then if they don't pay, you still have to um, somehow challenge them, usually in the courts. Mm -hmm. In most countries, the courts are fairly efficient for this type of small commercial dispute. So it doesn't take very long and it's not very costly. In Israel, it takes a very, very long time and it usually is very costly. So uh, that's why on enforcing contracts, uh, Israel is uh, ranked quite um, unfavorably. Um, any questions on Israel? So then with this, so remember, this is done for every year, for every country in the world, now for 16 or 17 years. So you have a very large database, which is also electronic, as I mentioned. So if you ever wanted to establish a business in any other location other than Tel Aviv, you know exactly how to, um, uh, how to do it. But once you collect this data, I go back to the beginning of the question of the theories of what government regulation is about. Because remember I told you 20, 25 years ago, lots of smart economists were, and actually lawyers as well, not just economists, uh, were asking this question, what's regulation about? And what's the right level of regulation? But nobody really had much data. So we collected the data so we can come back and others can come back and use this data, and many, many people have. And we can ask the question, one, how do governments around the world regulate? So what are some um, patterns uh, across regulation in different countries? <coughs> and then what does heavier or, or less heavy regulation result in? So what are the results of particular regulatory, uh, regulatory attitude of government? So I'll show you a few studies. The studies, uh, the authors of the studies are always reported here. These studies are, um, are published in the top economics journals, so some of the top ex economics journals, so we take them to be quite high quality um, uh, studies. Um, so one question that immediately comes to mind is, so suppose that it's easier to register businesses. So then you don't really have an incentive to be informal. So Israel, incidentally, you may know from your experience, is a country that relative to, Im to its income level has quite a lot of informality. Informality means that a business can operate but actually is not registered either for taxes or for um, labor regulation or even in terms of uh, the company registrar. So it operates but does not legally exist. Or more prevalent actually in the case of Israel, a business does exist, but only chooses to report a share of its revenue. So let's say 70%. Or so. so it's hiding some of its um, revenues away from the tax inspector, away from, um, from, um, from the regulators. Uh, so that share of informality, which economists have several ways to um, calculate in Israel, is between 25 and 30%. It's actually quite high. In the average OECD countries, it's more like 10 to 15%. Uh, so Israel is above, uh, above the average for its income group. And once you go to a country like India, we discussed India with um, some of my uh, table friends, um, informality is more than 90%. So actually the latest study on India says 91% of Indian business operates in the informal economy, meaning does not pay taxes, is not registered, um, 
are, does not exist. So you see them selling something or producing something, but if you ask, who are you? They say, nobody. I'm not really doing anything. I'm just passing through. <laughs> um, because they don't want to deal with the tax inspectors and other inspectors and so on. And informality, by the way, is probably the number one problem that, uh, that you have in, um, in developing countries, where I mention a country like India, above 90%. South Asia, on average, is about 80%, so Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and so on. Four out of every five businesses do something, but they don't legally exist. If you challenge them, so to speak, and say, well, who are you? Who are you reporting to? They say, nobody. I don't really um, exist. That figure is about 50 to 60 percent in Latin America, about 70 percent in your region, in the Middle Eastern uh, region, and about 75 percent in Africa. So it's actually huge. Informality is a very, very big uh, problem around the world. And economists for a long time have been arguing why do businesses stay informal? Is it because they are lazy, you know, one, so they don't want to go through the various processes? Is it because they are afraid of government for one reason or another? Maybe because they are doing illegal things, maybe because they think that the government is, I don't know, from the opposing party or opposing um, uh, ethnic background, or is it because it's just cumbersome and if you make it easier for businesses, they will turn from informal to formal. So there are a number of studies, uh, of, of which this is one. Uh, There's actually three different studies that uh, one looks at Bolivia, one looks at Sri Lanka, and one looks at Brazil uh, during a similar time period where these countries um, were making some significant uh, improvements, making it easier for businesses to uh, register. So in the case of Bolivia, which is the blue text at the top, for example, it used to take 50 days. Remember, in Israel, it was 12 days to start a business. In Bolivia, it used to take, in the mid-2000s, 50 days to start a business. And the government did some reforms and got to 30 days. So it's not great, but you know, it's a lot better than what it was uh, before. And at the same time, they were basically finding out which businesses are uh, registered and what did these businesses do before. So is it really a new startup that just started operations? Or is it that it existed before and it's just switched from informal to formal? So this particular study was more interesting in the latter and found out that uh, due to this simplification, if you like, of startup procedure, about 25 percent, 22 to 27 percent in the different regions in Bolivia turned from informal to formal. So they did exist in the informal economy, making it easier for them to um, register, um, basically made a quarter of them switch. Um, so then there is a question, actually mostly non, not economists, but political scientists are very excited about this uh, question of what does formality give you? So at the first base, I've told you that if you're a business, you start paying taxes, so the government is excited about it. Your workers are excited about it because suddenly they have rights. So if the employer does bad things to workers, they can go and challenge uh, uh, this in the courts or the labor tribunals of the country uh, and so on. But it also has one significant political effect, that the moment that you are formal, you're, well, sorry, there is another very significant uh, business effect, which is that your assets become formal. So now you can go to a bank and say, this is my business, this is how much money I make, I want a loan. And then some banks will give you a loan. If you're informal, no bank can give you a loan because you cannot actually show that you have, um, that you have, um, uh, you have a business, so that you have uh, a, revenue, um, a revenue line. In many countries, this is particularly true in Latin America and also in, um, in Africa, however, uh, formality gives you something else. It gives you a political voice. And that was unexpected in the early research that uh, we are doing. In what sense? In many countries, in order to vote, you need to show an address. So you need to show that I live here and therefore I vote here in that particular constituency. But since the vast majority of people are also informal, so they don't have documents in the sense of passports and so on, an easier way to document it is if you have a business, because the company registrar works generally better than the individuals, the birth uh, registry in many, in many countries. 
So in countries like Bolivia, which basically are bad at both individual registration and business registration, when business registration improved to the order of 25% more formality, suddenly during the next elections a lot more people started voting simply because now they can show an address remember the property registration topic if you can register your property you show an address a proof of address even if it's your business address you can go and say well i work for this business this is my um, uh, this is my uh, place of work and i live close by so i want to vote so suddenly in bolivia there was a lot more voting and actually across a number of latin american countries so as a result, democracy in some sense improved because you have a lot more people now voting than um, it was um, uh, it was before, and it was actually it is a consistent result also close across many African countries because typic typically in African countries you don't have very good registries uh, so to speak of birth. So if you have friends from many African countries and you ask them. When you are born, they would know. But then if you ask them, can you show me, sort of, not that you should ask your <laughs> friends, but can you show me when you are born, they would say, well, we don't have that particular document. So, um, so we don't know um, officially, but I know because of my parents and, uh, uh, and so on. The moment you do some of these business environment improvements, making it easier to um, uh, improve business regulation. It has also this big effect on democracy, it turns out, at least in Latin America and in, um, in Africa. I have a number of examples here. I'll just show you two more and I'll stop for um, questions. This, this is to show that even other rich or middle income countries like Portugal have the same issue and again can improve a lot. So on the, on the ranking that I showed you, Portugal by, ne by last year was doing quite well. But if, if I was doing this 10 years ago, uh, this same um, presentation, Portugal actually was the worst country in Europe, worse than, uh, worse than Israel. It was ranking around the number 100 around the world. So it was quite difficult to start businesses in Portugal. That changed during the Eurozone crisis, so around 2009-10, when, when Portugal, you may remember, went through a very significant uh, economic downturn. Many people got uh, to be unemployed. Um, the economy collapsed. And the then government decided, well, we need to do something to particularly allow young people um, to have job opportunities. At that time, 2010, which is when this study was done, Unemployment among young people, uh, meaning uh, people below the age of 30, was over 50%. So I imagine half of the young population was out of school and out of uh, jobs. So the government did a number of reforms. One of the reforms was, again, to um, basically make it a lot easier to start uh, businesses. So in that particular case, it used to take five months to start a business, a new business. They made it all electronic. So everything now, if you want to establish a Portuguese company, you go on one website, not on many websites, and you have still two or three procedures, so you need to click three times rather than just once, which is why it takes a few hours. But in principle, you can wake up in the morning in your pajamas and say, I'm going to establish a company in Lisbon, and by, by noon, the same day, you can have that um, company. It used to also take a lot of money to do it, now it, it still takes a bit of money, but a lot less. Uh, and once the government announced this, some good Portuguese economists said, let us measure very precisely what the impact of that uh, reform is. The reform was done in 2009, early 2010. So they measured before that what are the types of businesses that were registered and how many and who were the owners and then after that. So the answer, is, the answer for them was that within two years, there were 17% more business startups, so more businesses registered than in the two preceding years. There were 21% more employees in this new company, so not only there were more companies, but they were slightly larger than, uh, than the previous uh, companies. But most importantly, or perhaps most interestingly in this exercise, disproportionately a lot more women, and actually older people, uh, were registering companies. So at first this was a puzzle. Why is there this uh, difference in the ways that uh, men and women um, uh, register companies? Uh, so following these studies, there were a number of other studies trying to look at this phenomenon both in Portugal and actually in Brazil, which at the same time was doing, um, doing reforms. 
So the answer half of uh, this audience would not like and half probably would like. So it turns out that women like corruption less. So they are not as corrupt as men. So when the, when the process of registering a company was complicated and expensive in Portugal, men will find ways to basically bribe officials to get there faster or cheaper and so on. So they'll just wait, 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 and then find a way to uh, bribe themselves through the process. Well, women who are more law-abiding, principled, and so on wouldn't do that. So they'll just wait, 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 and then say, okay, I'm not going to do this. The system is corrupt, so I'm not going to establish a business. So the moment that the regulation changed and became a lot easier, a lot more women were actually going through the process and, um, and registering businesses and starting um, uh, starting a business. So much so that by this year, by 2018, if you go on the Forbes uh, richest people around the world and you pick, uh, pick Portugal, actually among the top five richest Portuguese uh, people, I'll let you find out who they are, actually there are three women and two men. So it turns out that not only women are uh, less corrupt, but they, at least in Portugal, seem to be better at, um, at uh, doing business. The point of this example, however, is again to return you to the beginning of why we are measuring regulation around the world. So it's not just that we want to know is it easy to do a business or not, that's interesting in itself. It's that if it is easier to do business in um, countries around the world, there are some other social effects. So in this case, um, one effect is, if you like, the inclusion of women and actually older people. Uh, in the case of Portugal, who would be involved in business, but otherwise would not, um, uh, would not be. In the previous study, it was people who are in the informal sector and therefore devoid both of business rights, credit rights, as well as political rights in some countries. And then the adoption of, let's say, better uh, business regulation made at least a portion of these people to be much more business active as well as political uh, active. I have a few more examples here, but maybe I'll stop for questions and perhaps I can return to some of the examples later. So if you have comments or questions, please. Yes. So big companies like Google and Apple, there are some people from Google here I know, so I need to be careful what I say, but they have lots of lawyers. Um, so Google goes to a country, they hire sort of top lawyers and they say, go do it and don't tell me how you did it. So if it's uh, easy to do it, lawyers just do it, uh, following the rules. And my guess is that if it's not very easy, lawyers find other ways to do it. So I wouldn't say that for a company like Google or Intel. So I mentioned the example of Starbucks. When Starbucks was trying to enter, it wasn't yet the huge international company that it was um, now, but probably did have lawyers and even the lawyers couldn't quite figure it, uh, uh, figure it out. Um, I think what's more perhaps relevant uh, is that if a company, even if it's a large company, decides to go to a new market. And suppose that they don't know the market very well, which most of the time actually happens. They need to look for a particular set of measures, of, um, of indicators to decide whether it's this market or another market. Because typically, as um, uh, CEOs of large companies can tell you, the way that they decide where to locate is they decide in, on a region first. Well, your region is a bit more complicated, but typically they decide on a region. And then within this region, they start to what's called forum shopping. So which country provides the best opportunities? But they already know that, let's say, in my region, Eastern Europe, they're either going to be in Bulgaria, in Romania, or Hungary, let's say. And then once they decide on these um, geographies, they visit the countries and then essentially ask the question, is it easy or difficult to do it? I'm continuously surprised how even very large global companies look at the doing business indicators essentially because they exist because it's a very transparent way to say how easy it is for other companies to do business and even if let's say google can do it very easily they still think well so this government makes it difficult for businesses maybe at some point it would make it difficult for me as well but even if it doesn't make it difficult for me it may make it difficult for some of my suppliers and since i depend on a lot of suppliers in every country that i operate <coughs> Maybe this is not the right country to pick. So we have seen many cases, and there is research also by others on many cases, where even very large companies like General Electric, for example, would pick one country versus another in a region based on this type of, um, this type of indicators. 
other questions? Yes. Um, if we choose to go back to the uh, pie chart. The pie chart, yes. Um, what I was wondering is whether you uh, the weight that you give to each one of these ingredients is the same. Uh, and what I'm getting at is that I think some of the measurements here are very relevant for starting a business mm -hmm. and some of it are very relevant for when you already run a business. <coughs> so in a way I ask myself, uh, by playing with the weight that we put on each ingredient, maybe we can have one, one uh, measurement that will be relevant for development, developing mm -hmm. countries and yeah. maybe another that is more relevant for already developed countries. So. Yeah, no, I understand, a very good question. So the short answer is for the purposes of the global ranking, they all equally uh, uh, weight, um, uh, weighted simply because we are not, it, it varies, as you say, a lot across countries, and we don't want to say well, for this country it's this weight, for that country it's that weight, so we do equally weight it. But on the website that I mentioned, doingbusiness.com or uh, .org, they is precisely for the reason that you mentioned, both for investors as well as for researchers, and actually for governments as well. We have the function of saying, so imagine that you're an investor. How do you weigh this? Probably starting a business is not very important if you're a larger company. You hire a lawyer and do it. But even with a lawyer in most countries, um, if you have to go to court, the enforcing contracts, you know, it's, it's an issue for you. Even Google has significant problems in the uh, judicial system of Israel and not just in, in uh, Israel. So you may want, if you're a large company, to put different weights. For example, enforcing contract is, you know, three times as important as, um, as starting a business. So the uh, methodology allows this very easily both for each investor but also for governments who say, well, we actually mostly want startups. You'd be surprised how many governments want to have a lot, a lot of businesses and they, when I ask them, well, but how these businesses grow, don't you worry about that? And say, ah, don't worry, once they come, we'll trick them, so they'll, uh, <laughs> we'll figure it out. So governments actually put a lot more emphasis on the first few while businesses, especially larger businesses, which I guess was your point, put a lot more emphasis on the last few of these. And the methodology allows you to weigh however you want to, um, uh, to weigh them. Yes? Isn't getting credit in the free market? What does the government have to do with that? Um, so getting credit is in the free market in the sense that if you go to a bank um, and um, ask for a credit, they look at your credit history, hopefully, or revenues, and then decide whether to give you credit or not. But there are lots of regulations across countries on exactly how this transaction would take uh, place. So actually there is a lot of role for government uh, here. So for example, many countries around the world, of which Israel is one, say anybody who collects financial information from you, so let's say your cell phone company or your utilities company, if you're paying electricity bills and so on, has to share this information with banks. Um, so it's called credit sharing uh, systems. And sometimes they are private, sometimes they are run by the central bank. Um, doesn't really matter. Well, sometimes it matters, but not often. But if you have a system like that in place, which is regulated, so there has to be a law providing this system, then it's a lot easier for banks, and not just banks, other financial institutions, to give you credit. Because you can go and say, I'm asking for credit for the first time to, I don't know, buy my car. They say, well, that's tough because we've never seen you before, so how do we know that you're a credit-worthy customer? You can, in systems that have credit information sharing, you can say, I've always paid my electricity bill, except when I was for two months in Mexico and I forgot, um, and I always pay my um, phone bill and so on. So this is one example where for getting credit you still need some um, regulation to make it difficult, to make it easy or not. Similarly, there are a number on the other side, um, there are a number of countries that basically mandate that you cannot get credit if, and they li list a number of, uh, so if you have ever gotten bankrupt, so my country Bulgaria has um, strange regulation like that that I tried to remove when I was finance minister but didn't quite succeed, but it says in the five years that follow you declaring bankrupt, not as an individual but as a company, you cannot actually get credit as an individual. It makes totally no sense, well, for most of us, but still there is such regulation. So you're right that the um, 
players here typically are private sector players, so you don't need the government to be giving you credit. But still, there are some regulations that the government puts in place either to make it easier or to make it worse. Uh, there and then there, there. Yes? Um, it's applied on medicine companies as well? So, so this is, um, in my previous lecture, somebody asked, well, is this, does this apply for, let's say, biotech companies or high-tech companies and so on? The answer to that, all of this applies to any type of companies, but in addition to that, medical companies or, chemi uh, you know, chemicals companies and so on have some additional regulations that apply for privacy, for example, apply for um, environmental concerns if there is some um, um, refuse or other things uh, that are dangerous to the population. So that on top of this, in other words, there are also some additional regulations that come into play that may make it more difficult for a company to register. Similarly, on the other side, different governments, particularly the Israeli government, has some, let's say, incentives for companies operating in particular fields, either tax incentives or regulatory incentives. These are typically larger companies or high-tech companies, as I mentioned in the case of Israel, where they would still follow all of these regulations, but then the, uh, the, the government can say, you don't have to pay all of your taxes. So you have a special way to pay taxes that is easier than this, um, than this way. So in short, all of this applies to every type of company, but some companies have additional regulation that they need to comply with and additional incentive that different governments give them. There's a question there and there. I think or I assume that most of the countries know its ranking. So mm -hmm. there is any way that you contact them trying to promote the specific subjects that the countries are not good in, maybe uh, make contact between two countries that in this specific country is worse in this subject and the other one is really good at, and then try to discuss uh, what is the best way to uh, promote it. Um. So yes, um, not directly the doing business team because it would be a conflict of interest if um, both the rankings are produced and then, and then you are contacted by governments to tell them what to do things. Um, but other teams within the World Bank actually are able to, uh, to do, um, let's say, advice. And also the website is we try to be as high tech as we can. Uh, so the website itself, if you go to it and let's say click on Israel and then click on enforcing contracts, you can create what's called the reform memo. So you can basically ask the website essentially to tell you what reforms if you are Israel or the Israeli government to do. And it generates automatically a report that basically tells you, here's where you are, here's where you differ from some of the countries like you in your income group, and here are the reforms that similar countries did in the last three years. So it generates automatically this report that tells you, you know, you're like Chile, for example, like Portugal. Portugal just did this. This is very relevant for you. If you want, here's the law that they passed. It doesn't quite give the phone number because these people would be annoyed if people are calling them from around the world. But you can basically find out what was done in other, uh, in other countries. <laughs> Governments do call the doing business team when I was running it, and they even call me now that I don't directly run the doing business team. Typically when they're upset, so they say this is totally untrue, we're much better than you are presenting us, you know, you probably are following some propaganda by the opposition to, you know, uh, make the government look bad. If you only come here, we'll show that we are much better. And we actually do travel quite a lot to, to go to governments and in the vast majority of times the government is wrong. So for a variety of reasons. Sometimes the top of the government, prime minister, finance minister simply don't know because they've never been in business or they've never started, um, uh, let's say, a business or tried to get credit and so on. So some of their people tell them, don't worry, we're much better than this. Uh, and then we go and go step by step. And I've been in many countries where, you know, we get to the point with the minister that they say it's much better than this. My recent favorite example was I was in Morocco. Somebody mentioned uh, Morocco on the table. So the minister of industry and economy was arguing that actually it's extremely easy to start a business. And it's like one stop shop, you show up and in 15 minutes, um, everything is done. So I said, great, so I'm here, you're here, let's go and basically do it. Show me how, um, how to do it. So there's this big confusion of where actually is the place, since the minister doesn't know where the place is. 
And then after half an hour we go with this like heavy security of you know <laughs> 10 cars driving with sirens along some kind of unknown location and getting lost here and there. We show up at a place and the place, this was around 11, 30 in the morning, was closed and there was this, I mean I couldn't read because it was in um, Arabic, but it basically sa said, I'm told, come tomorrow, so today we are closed and it was like Tuesday or something. <laughs> so you know, then when you meet this type of uh, ministers and they say we are much better and then you try it with them and they go on a Tuesday at 11, 30 and the place is closed, okay, so they're, next time they are not as, um, um, how to put it, as aggressive and say, yeah, maybe we need to do uh, uh, something. But that's in a way what the report is used. It's used to increase awareness in the governments that perhaps they should do better than they do. Uh, and there is quite a lot of competition. So last year India improved a lot on this ranking. This year the Pakistani government is sending delegation after delegation to improve themselves. So there is a lot of regional competition as well, which actually does, um, uh, does help reform. There was a question at the end. Yes. Uh, how does uh, the effect of Brexit come with, uh, with, uh, with doing business for Britain? Is it good for them? Is it bad for them? Um, so not perhaps directly re uh, reflected in the doing business rankings, but since I worked in London, so I can answer the question um, more broadly. So. A significant portion of the Brexit debate was that um, European Union is a big factor of, if you, if you like, slowing down British business uh, because a lot of regulation was done at the European level and if only the British government were to establish its own regulations it would be much better. Um, so that if you're, if you're following the, the uh, debates around um, around Brexit, that was a good, uh, a good topic. Which if you look at this table actually cannot be true by definition because you see European Union countries that are vastly different from each other. So if it were true that business in the UK was run by European regulation, then you know Greece wouldn't be 67th and uh, Denmark wouldn't be number three, right? They should have the same regulation. So the fact that they don't have the same regulation suggests that actually there are very large differences, clearly not run by uh, Brussels. In fact, at least at this stage, there have been attempts by um, uh, the Brussels bureaucracy to take over some of these uh, uh, areas. But at the moment, none of these areas, with the exception of value-added tax in, in, um, in paying taxes, is run by EU regulation. Every regulation that I've shown here is national level regulation even for the European Union. Because if you read the articles of um, in association of the European Union, there are some areas that are, belong to the nation states, like education is another area like that. And then there are a few areas which are purview of the Union itself. Of the regulatory areas that I'm showing you here, as I mentioned, only value-added tax is. Environmental regulation is actually part of the EU um, uh, per view regulation, but it's not part of this basic uh, uh, basic uh, setup. So in short, very little. So the UK is already quite good. Um, it wouldn't get better just because of Brexit. So if they were to be better, it would be just because they would have to compete now in, a, in some sense much more international market than uh, before. And hence these arguments by some of the politicians for leave uh, for Brexit that you know Europe is really retarding British business is not in fact true. But politicians say things that are not true quite a lot. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. And then here. <coughs> the index here, I try to measure how easy it is to do business. But mm -hmm. you do it in a quantitative way. Uh, you measure uh, in steps or in numbers. But sometimes I think it can do quality of how it's easy or not. And I can um, talk about two examples that you talked about. Um, when you need to pay for, uh, for different <coughs> places uh, the taxes, the tax, um, like I do today in my business, I need, I need to pay for a VAT and separately to pay for in an income tax. But it's not, um, it's not how to do it. You can do it in two clicks. It takes uh, 10 minutes. And in the other end, Israel is in a good place of, uh, of um, helping them and minority uh, mm -hmm. 
but but in the other end, um, it means that majority sometimes uh, are less power. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see it. Yeah. So so I asked about <coughs> what about the the quality you use when you measure in. Uh, so when you try to compare across the whole world, I mean, Israel has some issues, but it's still uh, high income, high quality of uh, education country and so on. Imagine this exercise that I just showed you, but doing it in the Kiribati or, you know, some of the small islands uh, uh, in, the, in the Pacific where, you know, there are not many regulators and there's not much of anything, but the team still has to do it or to do it in Yemen. I mean, I can tell you how we collect every year data in Yemen. Um, um, so uh, to be, to get to the exercise of cross-country comparison, you need to be simple. So we've chosen this, as you say, simplicity based on very hard numbers and also on regulations that if you argue with the government, it's very difficult for them to argue with us because we show them their law and says, do you have another law? This is what you published. So if you have another law, tell us and then we'll include it. But you're right that different uh, uh, businesses, and this is even precluding corruption, because with corruption you can do things uh, easier in many countries around the world. But even if just uh, uh, particular uh, knowledge or particular types of regulations that may be more relevant or less relevant for, uh, for businesses do indeed differ. So this provides like a very how to put it, a simple base for comparison. And on top of that, you want to ask the question. So somebody already asked the question. This is nice, but I want to know about medical uh, businesses. Well, there'll be other things that, uh, that matter. Or the team has often been asked in the past few years, we want to know about um, high-tech industry. So all of this, uh, somebody asked about uh, getting credit. This is still assuming a system where, you know, you're an Israeli company, you need to raise money and you go either to your own banks or to your own investors. So either minority shareholder protection is important or getting credit. But what if you're in this new kind of economy where you crowd, uh, crowdfund or where you have a uh, initial coin offering, let's say, uh, and you basically raise money from people that you don't even know around the world uh, electronically. So one, what rules do, do apply to that? Um, so we discussed actually with you that lately, you know, blockchains, if you do any business and you say it has blockchain, suddenly it's a lot more interesting business to investors. I think this is incidentally going to pass very soon uh, as investors figure out that the people talking about blockchains actually don't know what blockchains are um, about most of the time. But let's assume that we're having a, an ICO, so, so we have a company that does something with blockchain and we're raising money. Many of the rules that are here actually do not apply, right? Because uh, I actually do participate in several um, companies that have uh, uh, initial coin offerings. You know, it's a company that decides to be based in this is a real case in Estonia simply because Estonia has zero taxation on this type of companies. So they've never been, as far as I know, in Estonia. None of the founders are Estonian, but they're based uh, in. Um, in uh, Estonia, but when they need to raise uh, money, because Estonia is still considered, it's very nice on this index, by the way, so it ranks high, but still a lot of the American, let's say, investors don't even know where Estonia is, not to mention its business climate, so you need for that purposes to, for the raising money to be somewhere else. So then you can choose Luxembourg, for example, currently is quite hot, I think Switzerland is becoming hot again. Uh, Cyprus used to be very hot, but now many Russians are investing there, so regulators are a bit uh, worried. So you can have a company that essentially it's you and two of your other Israeli friends that you decide for tax purposes to put in um, Estonia and then to raise uh, um, uh, money around the world uh, based on, uh, let's say, Luxembourg, uh, Luxembourg uh, entity. Financial, uh, financial vehicle. In that regard, many of the topics that we discussed are just irrelevant, um, at least un until the point that you start raising lots of employees and they're based here, um, but even there you can have employees that work from around uh, the world. So for that you need a different type of database and actually we are starting to collect data that answers that question as well. So the company of the future how do you even track where to regulate it? Uh, and there is actually an issue, and one of the latest studies goes beyond this, 
that I'm involved in is basically asking this question. There has been a lot of research lately, uh, also in the private sector, by consulting companies, law firms that are trying to answer this question. The company of the future, where is it? So legally, where does it exist? How to advise it in terms of uh, uh, legal domicile, tax domicile, um, uh, and so on. So in some sense, the nature of the firm is changing tremendously. And again, on our table, we discussed this, to me, most exciting um, development that technology allows is that it used to be that you thought of the firm as a firm that produces something, then it has a marketing department, a sales department, an engineering department that produces the next product, and they're all together. Or maybe they're in different locations, but it's the same company. Now, in some sense, uh, you have a completely new breed of companies that don't produce anything. They're just marketplaces. So Airbnb, Uber, um, are examples that actually they literally have nothing. So they don't have assets, per se. They uh, decide where to be based on more or less completely, ran well, not random for, for them, but random for us decisions. Um, and they're just marketplaces. There is no product that they produce themselves. They just take other people's assets or other people's product, combine them, and they're the marketplace itself. Well, economists actually don't know how to deal with this because economists talk about there is the market and there are the firms, and the firms compete for a larger share of the market. But what if you're the market yourself? Well, then a lot of economic theory. So if for those of you who've studied economics for a few years, you just wasted a lot of, um, uh, of time on, um, on that. But it's very interesting, and it does not, the rules that are provided here do not yet apply. So the short answer is we need to study that in addition to what we studied here. <laughs> Maybe a last question, since some people are waiting for the Real Madrid championship game. <laughs> so, so you said that when you were starting out, there were a few theories floating around, and that you went on an information gathering mission. Yep. And I think that with the graph that the board showed, we have the information. But it seems that not every, to me it seems that the answer is very clear, that we need to move to less regulation, easier doing businesses. Um, but it's, it's certainly not going that way in every country. Right. So what would you say are the biggest hurdles into, to, to <coughs> overcoming those theories that are gone, that are not working, that are incorrect? And what would you say that should be, would you say that you're happy with how this turned out? Um, so I'll start from the end. So I'm reasonably happy how this turned up because, uh, so remember this is a ordinal ranking in the sense that you always compare to other countries. Um, the last one, which is called distance to frontier, to the ideal situation where basically everything is perfect and governments just have the basic uh, uh, regulation. So a hundred a score of a hundred DTF means distance to frontier, where a hundred means perfectly efficient regulation. Nobody has it. You see that even the top country is at 86, not at 100. But then these things that point out essentially tell you every year are countries improving or going down. And there are always countries that are going down. Venezuela has tried really to hit rock bottom uh, with regulation. But you see that even on this slide, Israel actually, relative to the previous year of data, has improved somewhat relative to itself. It's just that other countries have improved more. <coughs> So even though Israel is improving relative to where it was, at least in this past year, other countries are surpassing uh, it. So the world as a whole is becoming, on these indicators, a better place since we started this um, uh, 16, um, 17, year old, uh, 17 years ago. But still, there is this question that you're raising. So not everybody is improving. And there are actually some countries that are going the other way. Why is that the case? So, so far we've discussed just the government as one whole. Basically, you say there's business and government, and the government tries to regulate, business tries to avoid uh, regulation. But sort of in, even in the simplest theories of um, economic theories, government is not one. So you have the elected politicians, so Netanyahu, let's say, and you have bureaucrats who are running some of the registries and so on. 
even though together they are the government, they have very, very different interests. So the bureaucrat may have an interest in the average country, let's say not Israel, to extract bribes. So, you know, they are in their position, you're coming and saying, I want quickly to start a business, and they say, it would take you two months, but if you gave me some money, it would be done tomorrow. So what do you do? You probably bribe. Women, we learn, don't do it. Um, uh, so this bureaucrat, strictly speaking, has an incentive to have a lot of regulations because they're getting a lot of their money from that. Politicians typically want to look good, so they want somehow everybody to be happy with their performance. So, performance. so on average, they would like to probably have less regulations, so business is developing, so people are, uh, are happier. So you would expect most politicians to like easier regulation, except if somehow they depend either themselves or their political party on contributions, let's say, from particular businesses or interest groups or lobbying groups and so on. In which case you can have a lobbying group, can be a business, can be a particular constituency that says, if you remove this regulation, our business goes away. So I showed you in the case of Israel that actually um, Attorneys would not be happy if this becomes a fully online procedure because currently they get some money just by saying that yes, these are the right documents, give me some um, hundred dollars, let's say. Um, so if we remove this procedure, actually the lawyer's lobby, let's say, would not be particularly happy. Maybe this is a small amount for them, so if we hit them in some other things, they'll be even... Um, less happy, but the story here is that even politicians, well not even, politicians are especially uh, dependent on um, <coughs> contributions. Uh, and this can be legal contributions, this can be less than legal contributions, and they get affected by different lobbies or different companies. At the extreme case, and this is actually, uh, well, I would not comment on Israel, but many countries in the Middle East have this feature that politicians or politicians' families have direct interest in certain businesses or certain, um, uh, certain sectors. So there's, for example, a very interesting study of Tunisia under Ben Ali. I don't know whether you know Ben Ali was the president for a very, very long time in um, Tunisia. So his family controlled about a third of all bi private businesses, not public businesses, but private business. So you can literally say if a competition, a competitor comes, either Tunisian or foreign, in a sector where Ben Ali's family has an interest, immediately uh, regulation is raised so that this competitor cannot enter the market. Or if they enter the market, you know, they have to exit very quickly. So in many countries around the world, really the majority you can think of countries around the world, politicians also have conflict of interest, let's say. And that conflict of interest makes them to want to have heavier regulations in certain industries or across the board so that <coughs> companies related somewhat to them uh, can do better, or that companies that are coming in have to ask for favors for them to do, to do well, and then it would be the politician choice, is this company going to do well or not? I will, I will say that. So unfortunately, politicians are not just this benign um, uh, people who do all good, they also have their own uh, interests. And that's where actually the theory, after doing a lot of this uh, research, is going. What are the types of countries that are, in one case, where politicians actually want to do uh, good, but bureaucrats do not let them because of small corruption? What are countries like Tunisia that I mentioned that you know, the president controls half of the private business, so you know, they don't want any competition. And now there are some other variations of this uh, differing, um, differing interests. I think this is a good time, Bob, to yes, thank you. finish. Thank you very much for your interest. <laughs>